Sam's essay with Leo is trumping the empire. I need to take a deep breath after that description. Uh, okay, I'm going to speak for about uh, 15 minutes, maybe a little bit shorter. What Leo and I tried to do in our piece is to frame the nature of the contradictions that gave rise to Trump, to incorporate nationalism into the analysis of empire and of crisis, and to consider the contradictions that seem to be emerging out of Trump's tenure. For much of the left, the contradictions of the American empire at the turn of the millennium had largely centered on American declinism, the prospects of inter-imperial conflict, and a reversal of globalization, deglobalization. When the great financial crisis hit in 2008, many doubled down on that thrust, especially in light of the remarkable rise of China and its potentials as a challenger to US economic dominance. Global capitalism was and is indeed uneven, it's tension-ridden, and it's full of uncertainties. But the emphasis on economic crises missed the boat. The problem with such perspectives is that, first of all, they tended to misjudge the resiliency of US economic strength and its ability to lead in key high-tech manufacturing sectors, the media, business services like engineering, accounting, legal, and especially finance, and their ability to move into new sectors as old ones faded. Such perspectives also tended to underestimate the capacity of the American state to contain, if not prevent, crises as it did, as crises as it did through the financial crisis. And I emphasize, they couldn't prevent them. The question was, could they contain them? And that perspective also tended to underestimate the extent to which the combination of the above, in other words, the economic strength of the US empire and the nature of the American state, supported the continued internationalization of a global capital driven to nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, make connections everywhere. Dips in trade statistics were temporary, and in any case, didn't mean deglobalization. Capital flows continued to roam the globe. Cross-border mergers were as strong as ever. Global competition intensified. Protectionist pressures were generally contained. All of that referring to the period uh, after the financial crisis ended and leading into the period we're now in. There was a crisis. The distinction lay in a crisis for whom and what shape it took. The crisis had a material base, but the expression of the crisis itself wasn't primarily economic. It took the political form of, fest of festering popular frustrations and the delegitimation of state and party institutions. It was the very successes, not the failures, of the American empire that for working people came with the insecurities and sense of lost control and hope that led to the anger that the right exploited. It was this that led McKinsey, the McKinsey consultancy firm, which was a very important element in the making of global capitalism historically, to note that, quote, the post-war narrative of progress has lost some of its luster. The contradictions are showing up in politics. And in particular, nationalism was central to the right's mobilization. It's important to recognize that far from being antagonistic to globalization, an element of nationalism is actually a constituent part of globalization. The making of global capitalism has been superintended by the American state, but it rested on the actions of nation states, and it depended for its legitimation on those states. Globalization was sold in each country as being in the national interest, creating the paradox of globalization always leaving space for nation states and nationalism. The form of that nationalism varied across countries, shaped as it was by particular histories, their internal balance of class forces, and their place in the global order. In Germany, it took one form, in the UK another, and in the US, it was expressed in terms of allegedly rectifying the unfair burdens of empire that the US had been saddled with. If the US was the dominant power, why not use that leading role to more explicitly put America first? Moreover, that nationalist mobilization, with its accompanying rhetorical animosity to globalization, brought contradictions of globalization into the state, contradictions within the empire, not from without. 
In the US case, it revealed that the state was far from being monolithic, and a series of tensions emerged between Trump and various key departments, intelligence, national security, the State Department. In the past, when Congress, representing regional or industrial interests, threatened to throw a spanner into the works of globalization, ask for protectionism of some kind, it was the executive, the president and the executive, who reacted to read directives. Now it was Trump himself that was apparently leading the charge for particular interventions, and Congress was in, this, in a lot of cases trying to rein him in. The prospective defeat of Trump does not necessarily mean things will go back to normal. First, the US has lost a degree of ideological hegemony globally, which isn't likely to be reversed that easily. Second, there's the question of whether the Trump legacy has done permanent damage to the capacities of the American state with its cutbacks and departments that have historically been key to the making of global capitalism, like the Department of State and the Treasury. In this regard, it's notable that the Federal Reserve, whose insul insulation from congressional oversight emerged out of a fear of giving into popular pressures for economic expansion and jobs and their inflationary consequences, has largely retained its capacities. It's no small irony that its insulation from the Trump president is now seen by much of business, uh, of business as crucial to saving capitalism. Third, in having uncapped un un the worst of American nationalism, can this be put more or less back in the bottle? Or is it something that might reemerge in the future in perhaps even more virulent form? And fourth, the right success has also exposed the right's weaknesses. Rather than reversing the neoliberal attack on working class lives, Trump's policies of aggravated inequalities, undermined healthcare and environmental concerns, and attacked unions. Absent a commitment to follow through on challenging corporate power, Cap uh, Trumpism and the Republicans have no program to fulfill their vague promises, doubling down on nationalism, anti-immigration, racism, and authoritarian tendencies have their limits. Those limits are evident in Trump's accommodations in regard to Mexico, and it's now increasingly seems in regards to China. For all the threats and promises of the Trump was making about Mexico and reversing the loss of jobs, the US-Mexican-Canada trade agreement changed very little. It, this was made most evident when as soon as it was signed, GM immediately closed four plants in the US Midwest within the agreement. And in China, it now seems that the outcome will be not a new protectionism or a move to weaken China geopolitically, but to deepen its integration into the liberal order by liberalizing conditions for investment, which will have little or, no or nothing to do with the restoration of a manufacturing base in the US. Uh, in, in a speech that Xi Jinping made last summer, this was all uh, hinted at quite strongly. I'll just read from it. The great, kind of trouble, the great door of China's opening will now close, will not close. It will only get bigger and more open. China will continue to greatly ease market access, create a more attractive investment environment, strengthen the protection of intellectual property rights, voluntarily expand the imports, and create a more relaxed and orderly environment for domestic and foreign investment to invest in and to start businesses. The point is that China's presence is absolutely crucial. It raises all kinds of uncertainties, but where this has been heading to date has been the importance of China remaining integrated under the American empire rather than challenging it directly to re-bargain and to renegotiate its position and its status within that empire. The question then becomes whether the left, whose earlier failure to mobilize working class frustrations was the condition for the right's success, can now effectively chart and gain support of a progressive course. Looking at this question over the past two decades, there seems to be a slow trajectory from unfocused protest to social democratic politics. The Battle of Seattle raised the challenge of globalization, but as Leo has noted in uh, another article, it bypassed in its demonstrations and its marches the centers of US imperial power. It walked right by the treasury. 
Occupy moved closer to the main issue by introducing a class analysis, however crude. The Sanders campaign demonstrated a significant turn of activists, here and elsewhere, from protest to politics, from largely ignoring power in the state to starting to address the question of the state. And popular de discourse in the US today seems to be rejecting the neoliberal, neoliberal sentiments and evolving towards support for social democratic reforms. On the other hand, private sector unions have a lower density than they had in 1901. In spite of some inspiring struggles, public sector unions are losing their material base, and with that, their membership, due to the changes in labor laws and the payment of dues. And it cannot be said that there are any nationally coherent mass movements in the US or Canada, and potentially exciting projects like a new Green Deal remain vague. A central question for the socialist left will be to develop a politics that recognizes the limits of what's emerging in the current tendencies, but respects them in terms of them opening some space, for a more popular space, for the basis of a push from neoliberalism and the potential to expand that pace for a more radical politics. One that reaches beyond policies to address the development of working class understandings organizing capacity, strategic thinking, and what that what a radical politics would, in fact, entail. The left will, in particular, have to counter right-wing nationalism with a left internationalism. But that's not a matter of well-intentioned slogans. Just as globalization operated through nation-states, overcoming it can only operate through the nation-state. We can't, without taking power and addressing the nation state, declare the end of free trade, deal with alternatives, support the democratization of capital flows. These are fundamental in terms of taking state power and transforming the nature of the state. Let me just uh, conclude with uh, the final, final two sentences of, uh, of our article. Uh, especially in light of I'm having trouble reading this, but I'm going to try. Especially in light of the need for progressive immigration policies and protection of minority, minorities, a socialist internationalism which has substance must be, be one that builds on rather than denigrates or wishes away overlapping national and class social relations. Even in a global capitalist world, socialist internationalism today can only be conceived as securing greater room for maneuver for progressive, for progressive class struggles taking place at the level of nation states. Thank you.